Well, well, thank you uh, very much. I, you know, I, I want to uh, begin by uh, thanking Hugh Davies and the rest of the, the Center for Selective uh, CH Functionalization for giving me this I think, really unique opportunity to share with um, all of you some of the work that we've been doing at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, and so about five years ago, our lab became really interested in uh, stereoselective functionalization of unsaturated hydrocarbons, uh, some of the starting materials that I show here on this first slide. Um, in particular, when we started working on this, we were actually interested in a single chemical transformation, uh, the allylic amination of unactivated uh, terminal alkenes. And so this is a, a reaction that our field has been interested in for many decades, and I think primarily for two reasons. One, from a a uh, practical perspective, uh, if you could develop a stereoselective version of this reaction, you would have a really efficient way to take inexpensive and abundant starting materials uh, like olefins and convert them into building blocks for drug discovery and other applications. And I think the other reason why our field's been interested in this reaction is more of a conceptual reason. You know, you're trying to take a molecule that contains only inert CH and CC bonds and you're trying to selectively uh, insert a, a nitrogen atom, uh, both site selectively and stereoselectively. And I think when most of us think about uh, strategies for stereoselective allylic amination. We think of you know really beautiful work done by many labs uh, that uh, strategies that involve CH activation and CH insertion chemistry. And I've just listed the names of some of the labs who've worked in this area. And many of these labs are actually uh, involved with the the center that uh, the, the uh, center for CH functionalization. And so when we started thinking about this uh, reaction, uh, we were actually drawn to a uh, we different strategy. One that uh, was really pioneered by Sharpless and Cressy and others in the, the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and through a very different mechanism, uh, Sharpless and others took uh, the same types of starting materials uh, and converted them to the same type of a little combination product. Uh, instead of using CH activation or CH insertion chemistry, uh, they used pericyclic reactions. And, and so in, in the early work of Sharpless and others, uh, you know, they were able to take uh, unactivated alkenes and convert them into racemic a little combination products. And so we wondered, you know, could we somehow render these, this, uh, these reactions in anti-selective, uh, the, the allylic amination through pericyclic reaction? Uh, but there were a lot of challenges that, that this goal presented. And, and to explain those challenges, I will, let me describe this mechanism in a little bit more detail. So it's a two-step process. In the first step, uh, Sharpless and others uh, proposed that the uh, unactivated alkene undergoes an ene reaction with a, a nitrogen-based electrophilic oxidant. And so here I, you can see I draw these ene adducts in through two different resonance forms, uh, included in this uh, uh, Zwitter ionic resonance form. It's in the second step that you actually generate the carbon stereocenter in the thermal 2 3 arrangement step. And so if you're trying to develop a stereoselective version of this strategy, effectively uh, you need to try to develop an enantios, catalytic enantioselective 2 3 rearrangement. And I think that's where the problem lies. You know, we, we often teach our students that. Um, uh, two, three arrangements, especially of reactive substrates like these, are not easily amenable to uh, asymmetric, modern day asymmetric catalysis. And so we wanted to challenge that assumption that these types of two, three arrangements are, uh, cannot be rendered uh, catalytic and active selective. The, so the first thing we needed to do was get a sense of how stable these ene addicts were. I guess one thing that concerned us was that the early work by Sharpless and others never uh, actually isolated these ene addicts. They just observed the, the allylic amination products. So very quickly, we learned that these ene adducts are more stable than we thought they would be. So starting off with one octene as a, um, as a model substrate, we treated it with this uh, nitrogen-based electrophilic oxidant. And, and we quickly learned that these ene adducts can actually be observed by NMR. At low temperatures, they're relatively stable. Uh, at room temperature, after about a day or so, we saw significant amounts of 2-3 rearrangement uh, in solution. When we also tried to purify these ene addicts with uh, column chromatography, we also saw uh, the thermal 2 3 reaction. Uh, but fortunately for us, um, uh, what we observed was that in the course of the ene reaction, these ene uh, prod addicts actually crashed out as beautiful white solids. So now we can routinely purify them by filtration and store them in our minus 20 degree freezer for months, and they're very stable. And so the next question we had was, you know, how, would we, how can we accelerate the, the 2 3 arrangement with the catalyst? So initially, we thought that you know we viewed these ene addicts as kind of a, an allylic system that perhaps in the presence of a low valent metal could undergo an oxidative addition into this carbon sulfur bond, and, and so we treated this ene addict with various low valent metals: palladium zero, iridium one, rhodium one, and none of those seemed to give us any amounts of the desired uh, allylic amination product. But fortunately for us, in the presence of 
palladium two salts like palladium acetate, now we saw significant amounts of rearrangement. So this was a really exciting result for us. This is kind of the proof of catalysis that we, we were hoping to see. And so we assume these reactions proceed through a mechanism that's really reminiscent of Overman's uh, palladium catalyzed rearrangements, where the palladium, instead of going a, a, a palladium zero two catalytic cycle, we believe the palladium acts as a pi acid. So we think it uh, activates this double bond, bond for a cyclization event. And then we think this cyclic intermediate undergoes a fragmentation to generate the desired allylic amination product. And so we wanted to try to render these reactions in active selective with chiral palladium complexes. And, and to make a real long story short, we were able to realize that goal by using these uh, uh, bisox sazoline links. So we can start off with unactivated um, hydro, uh, uh, alkenes, these unsaturated hydrocarbons, perform the ene reaction, followed by the two, three rearrangement to generate the little combination products. And, and because we uh, you know, initially optimized this reaction with one octene as a model substrate, we could take other uh, both linear and slightly branched uh, unsaturated hydrocarbons and, and generate the little combination products. Uh, we also were able to incorporate different functional groups. So here I show an example of, of taking uh, the same dyeing starting material and generating two products. So, so this product shown here on the left is generated when we use the dyne as uh, in excess. And this product shown here on the right is when we use the electrophilic nitrogen-based oxidant in excess, and we can generate this product. Uh, so one important limitation to this chemistry is that nucleophilic functional groups don't work well. And so we think nucleophilic functional groups just add into the electrophilic oxidant before the ene reaction can occur. But if we protect the nucleophilic functional groups, uh, we can restore the reactivity. We also observed that uh, electrophilic functional groups work well in this chemistry, and you know it's because I think it's because you know we're dealing with an electrophilic oxidant and an electrophilic catalyst system. So electrophilic functional groups like aldehydes and nitriles and chlorides are all compatible with this chemistry. So you know at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that one of the motivations for studying oligomerization amination chemistry is the is the hope that you know, we could have as a field a, a more efficient way to take a really uh, inexpensive and abundant feedstock uh, starting materials and convert them into building blocks for drug discovery and other applications. And, and our hope is that you know, now the field will view not just CH activation and CH insertion chemistry, but also these uh, pericyclic reactions as maybe a useful strategy to, to perform stereoselective allylic aminations. Uh, and so we also wondered, you know, what else could we do with these enadics that we generate from terminal alkenes? You know, we had shown that uh, we could uh, obtain their reactivity with palladium catalysts to accelerate this intramolecular process, this uh, two, three arrangement. We wondered, uh, could we view these enadics as surrogates of alkenes to do other types of chemistry, maybe intermolecular chemistry? So instead of using palladium, could we use an, another metal catalyst and maybe an external nucleophile to realize intermolecular processes? And, and so we decided initially to focus on Grignard reagents with the hopes of being able to generate carbon-carbon bonds uh, in an, uh, effectively in an allylic alkylation process. And so we, we chose Grignard reagents for primarily two reasons. One, you know, they're, they're, uh, many of them are commercially available. They're relatively stable compared to other organometallic reagents. But the second reason is that uh, you know, there is a great deal of knowledge out there about how to control the reactivity of Grignard reagents with various allylic electrophiles, uh, both uh, to effectively control the, the, the reduce activity of these reactions. And so we learned that copper chemistry works really well. So now we can uh, take terminal alkenes perform the ene reaction, and without isolating the ene adduct, we can subject it to a copper catalysis in the presence of various Grignard reagents to generate uh, the allylic alkylation product, uh, the linear product with an internal a double bond with high E selectivity. By changing the reaction conditions, specifically the copper source, um, the, the ligand uh, using these Buckwell type ligands, importantly also the solvent and the temperature, we were able to switch the selectivity now to generate this constitutional isomer, the branch product in real high uh, branch lin linear selectivity. And, and what, the exciting thing about generating these branch products is that we can take this uh, branch product and do further chemistry, uh, which I'll show you in a couple of slides. Um, so we think that the, the reason for the switch in selectivity has to do with uh, the mechanism of uh, uh, this reaction, uh, which I try to summarize here on the slide. So in, initially, we think that uh, alkene starting material uh, undergoes an ene reaction. And then, so we actually need to use excess Grignard reagents to get high yields. We think one equivalent of Grignard reagent presumably activates this ene adduct to generate a more reactive all allylic system, which then engages with the copper catalyst. And we think that uh, either a monoalkyl cuprate or dialkyl cuprate intermediate could be generated. And based on really beautiful work done by Nakamura and others, we think the dialkyl cuprate intermediate is responsible for generating the product, sorry, uh, 
uh, through an oxidative addition to, uh, to do a copper three intermediate. Whereas we think the monoalkyl cuprate leads to the formation of the of the branch product. And so we were able to take these branch products um, and actually do some interesting chemistry with them. We could resubject them to the reaction conditions now using a different Grignard reagent to generate now a fully substituted carbon center, maintaining the high selectivity for the branch product. And so what this allows us to do now is to take a uh, really simple alkene starting material. So propylene perhaps being the simplest alkene starting material with allylic protons, and we can subject it to uh, three iterative rounds of this branch selective allylic alkylation chemistry to generate uh, fully substituted carbon centers. And so now we're having a lot of fun thinking about you know, what types of uh, products we can make with this chemistry. Uh, and I thought I'd just show you one quick slide about another class of unsaturated hydrocarbons that uh, uh, can react with these uh, nitrogen-based electrophilic oxidants. So based on a uh, really beautiful work done by Weinrub in the 80s, we knew that 1,3-dienes, uh, instead of undergoing uh, an ene reaction with these oxidants, can actually undergo a 4 plus 2 cycle addition. And so we wondered, could we take these 4 plus 2 addicts shown here on the slide and subject them to our copper chemistry? So we observed that 1,3-dienes uh, in, in the presence of this electrophilic oxidant and a copper callus and various aryl Grignard reagents to generate these products shown here, which we call amino aryllation products, where we've incorporated three new functional groups, a nitrogen-based functional group from the oxidant, an aryl ring from the Grignard reagent, and a new double bond with high Z uh, selectivity. Uh, by using uh, a aliphatic based Grignard reagents, we observed a very different product, what we call an amino thiolation product, where now the, uh, we have the nitrogen based group from the oxidant, the carbon based group from the Grignard reagent, but we've retained the sulfur that was originally in the electrophilic oxidant. And uh, in the chat room, I'd be happy to share with you some of our thoughts on why we observed this divergent uh, product selectivity with different classes of uh, Grignard reagents. And so what we've been able to do now is take terminal alkenes and subject them to uh, this oxidation with these electrophilic nitrogen-made oxidants. And now we've started to you know, see that we can generate uh, products that, in which we do perform, for example, a little combination, installation of a nitrogen-based functional group, installation of a carbon-based functional group. And we're just starting to see some enantioselectivity in our copper chemistry with this uh, and uh, we're, we're hoping that we can, uh, you know, generate many uh, different types of products, a diverse range of products, starting with terminal alkenes using this new approach that relies on pericyclic reactions instead of CH activation or CH functionalization. So the last thing I want to share with you is our more recent goal of uh, not just applying this, this concept to terminal alkenes, but applying it to internal alkenes. And I think the, the stereoselective uh, functional, allylic functionalizations of internal alkenes is, is an important problem in our field that that has uh, been studied uh, considerably less than, than terminal alkenes. And, and to explain why we think uh, term, that internal alkenes are more challenging class of substrates, let me uh, describe what we view to be the challenges when you're trying to select, develop selective allylic functionalizations. With terminal alkenes, uh, effectively, you're trying to distinguish between two products, two enantiomers. Uh, and, and so there have been many beautiful approaches developed by different labs uh, using chiral catalysts uh, as well as chiral reagents to realize. Uh, uh, nanti-selective allylic aminations, allylic alkylations, and other processes. Um, and so the problem with internal alkenes is that you've multiplied the challenges that you have to address. Not only do you have to address the issue of enantioselectivity, but you also have to address the issue of easy selectivity because the product itself uh, is an internal alkene. And so you have to uh, address that. And also, if you start off with an unsymmetrical internal alkene where R and R prime are not the same, you have to address what I think is perhaps the most challenging uh, issue, uh, that, and that's a reduce activity. You have to distinguish between constitutional isomers. And, and, and you know, if you look at the literature, perhaps uh, the, the only general uh, effective way to uh, realize um, uh, it's stereoselective and reduce-selective functionalizations of internal alkenes has been worked on by Hugh Davies' lab uh, with uh, acyclic internal olefins. Uh, a lot of the other work with internal alkenes is focused on cyclic uh, internal olefins. And so we wondered, you know, could we apply this ene reaction that we've, we've been studying uh, to address this, uh, this goal? And, and so, you know, so far I've shown you what we've been able to do with the ene products. You know, we've generated the ene products and then uh, focused on using uh, catalysts to uh, functionalize those ene products. And so with internal alkenes, we decided to focus on this first step, the ene reaction. And the reason for that is uh, the product of an ene reaction with an internal alkene is chiral in and of itself. You have this ca carbon-based stereocenter. And so we wondered, could we use a chiral Lewis acid 
uh, to develop an, an enantioselective version of the scene reaction. The problem here was that in the presence of various Carl-Lewis acids, we obtain racemic product. And the reason is because this uh, electrophilic oxidant is highly reactive. Even at minus 78 degrees, we saw a significant background reaction in the absence of any catalyst. So we decided to dial down the reactivity of these oxidants using uh, this uh, oxygen-based oxidant now that was uh, 10 times less reactive than the original oxidant. And now we saw no background reaction all the way up to minus 10 degrees, which allowed us at minus 70 degrees to use this antimony pentachloride binol system uh, to generate the uh, uh, oxidation product through an in reaction with good yields and EEs. And so I just wanted to show you some of the types of products we can make. Initially, we decided to focus on using uh, symmetrical internal alkenes. And as you can see, we could take various uh, unsaturated hydrocarbons that contain internal uh, unsaturation and generate the products with uh, good yields, uh, EEs, as well as high selectivity for the E of, uh, we were also able to incorporate various functional groups. So for example, chlorides, as well as other halides, bromides and iodides, trifluoromethyl groups were also compatible. Uh, and so uh, once again, one important limitation was that nucleophilic functional groups were, uh, would shut down the reaction. We think presumably by adding into the electrophilic oxidant before the in reaction can occur. But if we protect nucleophilic functional groups such as alcohols and indoles, we're able to restore the reactivity. So the big question we had was what happens when we try to perform these reactions in, with unsymmetrical alkenes? Do we observe any reduced activity? And we decided to ask that question in a systematic way by, by designing a series of different substrates that had different types of allylic carbon. So when we, had, when we looked at a substrate with a competition between a methylene allylic carbon and a methylene allylic carbon, we saw selective in reaction with the methylene carbon. And the selectivity was really high, uh, greater than 20 to 1. Similarly, we saw the same type of selectivity when we had a competition between a methylene carbon and a methyl carbon. Once again, high uh, region selectivity. Um, we also observed an electronic effect. So uh, when we installed electron withdrawing groups such as chlorides, depending on the distance between the chloride and the initial double bond, we either saw a really poor region selectivity or if we moved the chloride one carbon closer, we saw a very high region selectivity. And this electronic effect was maintained with other uh, functional groups, for example, iodide also uh, uh, led to some uh, a good level of regious activity, as did a uh, trifluoroacetate group. Even a simple phenyl ring gave us some regious activity. It's not high, but the fact that we saw any regious activity was exciting to us. And so what's emerged is now a series of trends that allows us to predict the outcome of these reactions in, in the presence of different types of unsymmetrical internal alkenes. So we both based on steric and electronic effects, we are able to now predict in many cases what the outcome of the reactions will be. And so I thought I'd just show you two examples of uh, substrates that contain multiple internal double bonds. And based on our uh, you know, uh, uh, trends that we observed, we could predict the outcome of these reactions. For example, this substrate that contains three sets of allylic carbons, we saw a selective reaction with this allylic uh, system here, and, and we predicted that based on the observation that styrene systems are not reactive in our system and that methylene carbons react preferentially to methyl carbons. So we saw high re regions selectivity. Also, the substrate that contains four different sets of allylic uh, systems, we saw selective reaction with this uh, uh, allylic system. Um, um, and so uh, we think this reaction proceeds through a mechanism that's really reminiscent of early work done by Ishihara and Yamamoto, as well as Corey where the antimony binol system, instead of acting as a chiral Lewis acid, we think is acting as a Lewis acid assisted bronsted acid. And so we think this reaction proceeds through a closed transition state where the, this bronsted acid is uh, activating our uh, oxidant uh, uh, through a lumor lowering mechanism. And then uh, we think this uh, coordination leads to uh, the observed enantioselectivity as well as the regioselectivity. Um, so we think that this closed transition state can account for the preference uh, in the regioselectivity trends we observe with methylene versus methylene carbons, for example, where uh, reactivity with the methylene system would lead to undesirable synpentane interactions in the transition states. And so we can do a similar analysis with the different uh, 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 types of substrates. And so finally, I want to show you what we can do with these allylic oxidation products. You know, hopefully I've shown you that we can now generate one allylic oxidation product uh, starting with uh, unsymmetrical alkenes. We can generate it selectively. And we wondered, could we take advantage of all these uh, atoms in this electro, uh, this allylic oxidation product to generate many different types of products? Uh, and so we've started doing, being able to do that. So for example, this sulfur in this allylic oxidation product can lead to the formation of allylic thiols through reduction. Uh, we can uh, for, for, form this allylic alcohol through a stereoselective 2-3 rearrangement. And 
Alternative theories like the 2-3 arrangement with the loose acid can lead to the uh, carbon-nitrogen bond. We can use our copper chemistry to form these enantiomer-enriched uh, unsaturated hydrocarbons. And finally, we can use electrophilic sources of chlorine, for example, to generate these little chlorides. Um, and so with that, uh, I'll end by just, you know, uh, you know, re-emphasizing, hopefully I've shown you that, uh, you know, sigma uh, that pericyclic reactions and sigmatropic arrangements can be maybe a different way to think about doing stereoselective functionalization, a little functionalization of alkenes. And, and finally, I just want to thank my group. Uh, it's, you know, it's a group that I'm really proud of. Uh, uh, and so I just want to introduce you to some of them. Uh, Hong Li Bao is a former member of the lab who developed the little amination chemistry and also initiated a lot of the copper chemistry. Uh, and then the, the dyeing chemistry was done uh, uh, by Chris Slee. Um, and, uh, Ling Shin did the branch selective alkylation chemistry. And then the, the last part of my talk on the uh, chemistry with internal alkenes is work done by Lila Baye and, and Fong Li. And I, I really want to highlight uh, Lila's work. Uh, you know, it was uh, the little emanation, the little functionalization chemistry with internal alkenes is one of the most challenging projects I've been a part of. And I think Lila really pushed that project intellectually and experimentally. Um, and so I'd like, also like to thank the funding agencies and once again, the, the Center for uh, CH Functionalization for giving me this opportunity. And I'd be happy to answer your question through the chats.